Well, good morning. It's time for the sermon. If you got a bulletin on the way in, if you would pull that out and get a hold of the sermon notes that way, it'll help you follow along a little bit with what we're looking at this morning. We're in the middle of a series through the life of Jesus, as it's been recorded by uh, Dr. Luke in the Gospel of Luke. And today we are in Luke chapter 4 and uh, verses 14 and following. I spent a couple hours this past Monday uh, sorting through some old home movies that my mother had shipped over to our house. After our kids were born, uh, my parents made the trek to visit pretty much every year, uh, three times a year for those birthdays. And early on in the, the process, they started to videotape their visits and videotape the highlights uh, for each visit. I say highlights, but most of the movies are uh, pretty slow moving. Uh, some involve looking at the back of the couch for an extended period of time because the camera got set down while it was still going. Uh, and most involve every present being gradually opened by each child. But it's fun to see uh, what our kids were uh, like when they were the age that a couple of their kids are now. Um, but those little faces always bring back a smile. Uh, but one of the tapes that I plotted through this week, this past Monday, was uh, taken in April of the year 2000 on the Sunday that Justin was baptized in our first church in Parkersburg, West Virginia. My mother taped the entire service. And so you see the opening, you see the hymns being sung, you see the special music, and of course the baptism. That was what the whole thing was. And as I watched through all of that, and especially watched the baptism, um, enjoyed seeing those memories from so long ago. But then just like in any other service, the sermon started, and quite frankly, that was when I hit fast forward on the tape. Uh, and I know, you know, you guys can relate to that a little bit because even on fast forward, it just kept going and going and going and going. I read a joke this past week uh, that a parishioner was greeting the pastor after the service and said, Pastor, your sermon today reminded me of the peace and the love of God. And the pastor was thinking, I don't know why. I mean, that really wasn't what my sermon was about. And so he asked, well, why was that? And the man said, well... It's because that sermon endured forever. Well, anyway, watching that guy preach on fast forward, uh, it still struck me with a few things. You know, one, he had a lot more hair and his hair was a lot darker uh, 22 years ago. Uh, the double-breasted suit and the wide floral tie really aren't fashionable anymore. Uh, so much has changed in the past 22 years. But the one thing that really resonated with me as I, as I watched that and thought about it this past week was that what happened that Sunday in that church and in churches across the world every Sunday ever since and long before uh, is that God's word was open, God's word was read, God's word was applied to people's lives. There's a reason that the sermon is the central part of our worship service every single Sunday when we gather. And that is because the pattern for worship tracks back to the early church and even further still, uh, back to the personal ministry of Jesus, and it pivots around the opening, the reading, and the explaining of God's Word. It's always been the primary way that God interacts with His people gathered for worship is through His Word. And this morning's text shows that. It shows that right in Jesus' ministry, that right from the beginning, right from the start of his ministry, Jesus had this custom of spending time every, every Sabbath at the local synagogue teaching from God's Word. So if you've got a Bible or the Bible app on your phone, if you would find Luke chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 14 today. <clears throat> Verses 14 and 15 are transition verses. Uh, last Sunday we looked in on the, the 40 days of temptation in which Jesus endured in the wilderness with the devil going toe-to-toe, -to -toe, trying to get the Son of God uh, to give in and to try and get him to sin, and Jesus rebuffed that. Uh, Satan failed that attempt. But then it says, verse 14, right after that, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. And for the next three years, that would accurately describe the ministry of Jesus' life. 
in the power of the Holy Spirit. He traveled, he taught, and as we're going to see in the next verse, he did some eye-popping miracles and drew a crowd. Uh, after a brief time of that happening around uh, Israel and especially in the region of Galilee, Jesus came home. He came back to his hometown of Nazareth. And we get to look in on, in the remainder of chapter 4, two shocking Sabbaths. Uh, two shocking worship services, if you will, right at the start of Jesus' ministry. We're filling a blank. Sabbath number one is called this, a surprising sermon in Jesus' hometown. A surprising sermon in Jesus' hometown. Verse uh, 16. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Nazareth was the small town where Joseph and Mary uh, were from and where they returned to after Jesus' birth. It is an out-of-the-way place. Uh, it was also a Roman outpost, and so a regiment of Roman soldiers were stationed there and wandered the streets and caused uh, problems for the residents. It was a place where everybody knew everybody, and like most small towns, everybody knew everybody else's business, or at least they thought that they did. And for 30 years, Jesus had lived there. He'd been right in the middle of that. And then he stepped on, onto the big stage of public ministry as a rabbi. And word had filtered back home. People were talking about, hey, the, the carpenter's kid making a big splash uh, around the region. And so Jesus came home. And uh, as was his custom, every single Sabbath... He entered the synagogue for the worship service. Now, the liturgy of Jew Jewish services involved reading several scripture passages and explaining those scripture. And as the leaders of the service that day uh, recognized Jesus, they asked him to, to be the guest uh, teacher, the guest preacher. And so uh, he pulled out the scroll of Isaiah and went to a very significant section. He enrolled it to Isaiah chapter 60 to 62, uh, which is a section of Isaiah's prophecy that pointed forward to the day when Israel would be restored, the Messiah would come and arrive, and blessing would be experienced by the people of Israel. Uh, the middle section of that is a very unique section. And chapter 61 is a very unique section in that it's written from a first-person perspective. It's almost as if God gave to Isaiah hundreds of years before uh, the exact words that the Messiah would say when he arrived on the scene and began to fulfill Isaiah chapter 60 to 62. It's written from a first-person perspective. And so Jesus turned there. He turned right to Isaiah 61 and he, he began to read, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Jesus stopped and he stopped at an important point. It says he sat down, because that's how Jewish rabbis taught. They sit at the front of the service and will teach from a seating position. And he began by saying, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, this unique prophecy given by Isaiah, words to be spoken by the Messiah, are being fulfilled right now in my life and in our time. Jesus knew his mission right from the start, preaching the good news of God's kingdom. 
The Jews looked forward for hundreds of years for the coming of the, the arrival of the Messiah. Uh, this one who would come, would sit on David's throne, would put things back together the way that they were supposed to be and restore their nation to its former glory. So much of the content that, that's surrounding the, that chapter in Isaiah, uh, so much of the content described that very thing. But Jesus chose this one sliver, this one little piece out of it because it explained what he was here to do right now. He was here in the power of the Spirit of the Lord to preach good news, to preach the gospel to those in need. He was here to announce that freedom and light and deliverance uh, were soon coming. And he was here to bring the kingdom of God to earth. But he was not here just yet to do what they wanted, to do what they had hoped for. In fact, where he stopped actually highlights that because, you know, he stopped with that phrase to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. If you go back to Isaiah chapter 61 and read verse 2, it continues to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Now, every Jew that knew Isaiah 61 by heart, they heard that phrase in their head. They, they expected those words to come out of Jesus' mouth, but he, he stopped or he stopped. He wasn't here yet to mete out the vengeance uh, of God on Israel's enemies. That was still and is still for a future time. Um, but the popular vision of the Messiah's role was that he would, he would do that. He would, he would uh, mete out vengeance on the occupying Romans, many of them housed right there in Nazareth. But Jesus was not here for that just yet. He was here to solve a greater need providing spiritual deliverance for the people of Israel and for the entire world. Now, they weren't quite ready to hear that. You go to verse 22. It says, All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Then start asking questions. But isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself, and you will tell me, Do here in my, your hometown what we have heard that you did at Capernaum. Uh, Nazareth's favorite son, famous son, had come home. And at first it, it goes okay. At first he's accepted, but then the people start processing this and start asking some questions. And, and, and you know, somebody said, No, wait a minute. Is it, isn't that Joseph's kid? Uh, and, you know, and somebody else thought, you know, didn't he make Aunt Betty's kitchen table? Uh, what's the big thing about him claiming to be the Messiah? Claiming Isaiah 61 applies to him. And at least the discussions Jesus says there, you know, prophets don't usually get accepted in their, in their hometown. He's going to build on that. He's going to build on that in verse 24. He says, truly I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. Jesus knows their thoughts and, and sort of stirs the pot here. He says, you know, the, the first major two prophets, they had to go outside Israel in order to do their greatest, most impactful ministries. Elijah uh, stayed outside of, of Israel's borders with a widow in, in uh, Zarephath in order to perform the greatest miracle that he did, bringing her son back to life. Elisha. Uh, Elisha impacted the, uh, the life of Naaman, who was the captain of Israel's greatest enemy, healing his leprosy. Both individuals, not even Jews, not even inside the, the boundaries of the nation of Israel. Um, and it's subtle, but it's an intentional point. It's an intentional point, and Jesus' first rec recorded sermon that his role, his mission, was not just to reach those that knew him so well, that had watched him grow up from being little Jesus to who he is now, or even, even those just inside the borders of Israel. He was coming to offer freedom from sin and the good news of salvation to all people, to the entire world. And it was a sermon that, that didn't land well. It didn't land well. We've all 
Uh, everybody that's uh, preached a sermon has some uh, examples in mind of sermons that didn't land well. Well, this one really didn't. It says in verse 28, All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town, took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and he went on his way. The people most familiar with Jesus tried to kill Jesus, but Jesus being who he is, he just, he just walked through. Um, but it gives me this point. Something to think about. Those most familiar with Jesus, they missed out on. They missed out on Jesus. And it seems sad, you know? These people that should have been the most welcoming and the most accepting and, and the most in his corner missed out. They missed out on Jesus. And I think about that and realize that it's pretty common still. It's pretty common still that those most familiar with Jesus can miss out on Jesus. Back in the uh, 1800s, a pastor by the name of J.C. Ryle wrote about this whole idea. And Ryle wrote this. He said, Nothing so hardens the heart of man as a barren familiarity with sacred, sacred things. Nothing so hardens the heart of man as barren familiarity with sacred things. It's quite common for people to grow up in church, to know the right answers, even believe the right things about Jesus, and yet still be lost. They know enough to get by. They have heard all the stories. But a relationship of faith in Jesus never really took root. They're familiar. They have familiarity. But they don't have faith. First book that I read by Kyle Edelman was called Not a Fan. And we all understand, you know, the word fan and the culture of fanness in our society. And uh, Kyle capitalizes on that in writing his whole book. Uh, you know, that, that as American culture, we get what it means to be a fan. We are fans of our favorite sports team. We have fans of different personalities. Fanness is part of our society. But it can slip into the way that we even approach a relationship with God and what it means to be a Christian. Eidelman wrote this. He said, Jesus has a lot of fans these days. Fans who cheer for him when things are going well, but who walk away when it's difficult. Fans who sit safely in the stands cheering, but they know nothing of the sacrifice and pain of the field. Fans of Jesus who know all about him but they don't really know him. But Jesus was never interested in having fans. When he defines what kind of relationship he wants, enthusiastic admirer isn't an option. My concern, Kyle wrote, is that many of our churches in America have gone from being sanctuaries to becoming stadiums. And every week all the fans come to the stadium where they cheer for Jesus but have no interest in truly following him. The biggest threat to the church today is fans who call themselves Christians but aren't actually interested in following Christ. They want to be close, close enough to Jesus to get all the benefits, but not so close that it requires anything from them. See, it's still possible it's still possible to be familiar with Jesus, but actually miss out on Jesus. It happened following Jesus' very first sermon. And it was underlined by what happens the second Sabbath that we're going to look at. The second Sabbath, shocking Sabbath encounter that Luke records. If you keep reading, you'll learn about the supernatural encounter in Capernaum. Verse 31. And he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath he taught the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. And in the synagogue there was a man possessed by a demon and impure spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Go away! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. 
Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. All the people were amazed and said to each other, what words these are, what authority and power he gives to impure spirits. And, and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. Kind of interesting, isn't it? You've got a demon-possessed guy right in church. Um, when I was in Israel, we actually went to the synagogue in Capernaum. And the foundation is still there for the same building that Jesus taught in. Uh, the superstructure is different, what's been excavated there, but the foundation is the same. And it was one of those blow-your-mind blow moments to stand there and to think, Jesus stood right here, Jesus taught right here. And more than that even, Jesus kicked a demon out uh, right here. And you notice the demon knew exactly who Jesus was. That happens over and over again in the Gospels. Uh, the demon had a better handle on Jesus' true identity than the people that had watched him grow up in his hometown of Nazareth. In fact, you know, you could jot this down. Every demon had, that has encountered Jesus acknowledged the truth. Every demon, right? In the chapter we'll see today a couple times. Every demon that encountered Jesus acknowledged the truth that he was and he is the Son of God. But it was an amazing thing to see. Jesus tosses this demon out of a demon-possessed man right there in the, in the church service. And everybody's amazed. Everybody's blown away at what they just witnessed, what they just saw. Uh, we would have the same response if we were in the presence of Jesus. No one had ever taught like this before. No one had ever had such authority over the demonic world like this before. They'd never seen anything like it. Sometime back, I came across some old photos of historical moments, and uh, I, I pulled them out this past week, share a couple with you. The first one here, this is a picture of a 5 megabyte IBM hard drive, and the picture's taken in 1956, but that's megabyte MB, not GB, not gigabyte like you're used to hearing, uh, much smaller. In fact, if you have a cell phone uh, in your pocket today, it has at least, at least 300 times the storage capability of that monstrous box that their four guys are trying to shove into the back of a, of a truck. Um, things have definitely changed since 1956. But the picture that I thought of as an example of what these verses talk about is this one. This was a picture that was taken in 1948, capturing a boy standing on a street in front of a store, seeing the moving images of television for the very first time. He's just looking in his eyes. He's looking in his face. And he's amazed. He's blown away by this box has this picture of this woman. And she's talking. And it seems so real. Seeing that for the first time was amazing. Now, you and I, we, you know, we watch television all the time. We watch the same thing on our, on our computer screens. It's not startling to us at all. It's very familiar. We're used to it. We're accustomed to it. And it really doesn't affect us like it affected that kid as he looked at that, that picture for the very first time. And again, I think that carries over spiritually. The passing of time, the familiarity we have with Jesus, who he is and what he did, it can mean that we lose a little bit of the amazement that we once had and then especially that these folks had seeing who Jesus was and seeing what Jesus could do for the very first time. It was a shocking Sabbath to witness that, and it wasn't quite done. You keep reading verse 38. Jesus left the synagogue, went to the home of Simon. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. She bent over her, so he bent over her, and he rebuked the fever, and it just left. She got up at once, began to wait on them. At sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people, shouting, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them, wouldn't allow them to speak, because they knew he was the Messiah. In the city of Capernaum, archaeologists believe they've located Simon Peter's mother-in-law's home. 
uh, in the early centuries of the church. It was identified as a sacred place, and so a church was built over it. I know that seems kind of unusual to us today, but that was the way that they preserved things in those first few hundred years. If they came across the spot that local tradition held, this was where this amazing thing happened, they would build a church on the top of it, and that way it couldn't be desecrated um, by others. Today, there's a Catholic church that sits on top of what the archaeologists have uncovered below there, and you can look down through the glass floor and see into this very small home where it's believed that Jesus miraculously stepped in and instantly healed this very sick woman. That was the Sabbath, and so were the, the rules about traveling and much activity. But once the sun went down, the Sabbath was over, and, and people showed up from everywhere, including some demon-possessed individuals again. And this is the second time, second time in 24 hours, uh, when demons identified Jesus as the Son of God. Now, obviously, those demons did not believe in Jesus. Um... They had chosen their path of rebellion, but their example is just so striking. They believed the truth about Jesus, even though they did not believe in Jesus. There's a big difference. I'll talk about that more. But it was this amazing day, and, and uh, all these things took place. The second shocking Sabbath. And the chapter, you have to kind of read the last couple verses to get a cap on it, but um, the, cha the chapter closes with what happens the next morning. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in synagogues of Judea. After all that took place, you know, the powerful teaching, the supernatural encounters with demonic things, the amazing miracles, this crowd was excited, was wanted more. Hey, what does Jesus do? He does what he did so many times. Uh, he slipped away. Slipped away from it all. And he would do that over and over again and find it recorded as we'll see. We walk through the Gospel of Luke together. And he probably did it every day of his life. He got alone to pray, to connect, to draw closer to his Heavenly Father. And so despite the amazement of the people, the allure of popularity, Jesus maintained his focus by getting alone with his Father. So much that happened. And these two shocking Sabbaths, there's just so many things in this one little section of the life of Jesus as recorded by Luke. So, how do we boil it down? What do we gain from that? I've I got a few things I want you to, to consider. and just call them lingering lessons from the way Jesus began. And here's the first one. The scripture, the supernatural, and the signs, they all indicated that Jesus was the Son of God. His identity had to be dealt with then and still. Isaiah's words, quoted from Isaiah 61, the fear-filled testimony of these demons who knew who he was and didn't want anything to do with him, and the repeated miracles of healing, they all point to the fact that, that Jesus was not just a wise man, he was not just a moral, good teacher. He was and he is the Son of God. And a human body who came to this earth in real history on a specific mission. I realize it's popular in our culture today to sort of marginalize the Bible. Uh, to give a nod to Jesus at Christmas, but not really grapple with who he actually is. If Jesus is truly what scripture, the supernatural, and every sign that he did indicates... If Jesus truly is the actual Son of God, then his life here is the most important event that has ever taken place in all of history. And what he did has ramifications for every person that has ever lived. And that includes every person here. You may have grown up in church. You might know all the right answers. But I want to ask you, have you really considered who Jesus is? If what the Bible says... If what the Bible says is an accurate portrayal of what happened in actual history, then God came here for a purpose. God died on a cross intentionally. 
Uh, he came to free people like you and me from our sin. If we will just choose, decide to believe. Not believe things about him, not believe facts, but believe in him. Um, believe in him as our personal Savior, Lord, and God. And we're all at a different place, but I want to invite you this morning to, to consider. Has that happened in my life? Is that true of me? Do I just know a lot about Jesus or am I actually anchoring my hope for eternity and my life right now, my faith in who he is? The son of God who came here to save me. If you're not sure, I'd love to talk to you about that even today. Here's the second thing. It's possible, it's possible to allow your heart to become familiar with Jesus in a superficial way way. But Jesus isn't looking for people that'll just be superficial. He's not looking for fans who believe things about him. He's looking for fully committed followers of him uh, who will believe in him and then live for him every single day. Consider it uh, one of the greatest blessings of my life to have pastored in one church uh, f long enough to watch a generation grow up. Uh, this March, uh, our family will have been in Everett for 19 years, and that's a long time. But I look back on that, and I am uh, just very grateful uh, to have been able to participate in uh, the, the life, the growing up years of so many, so many young people. Uh, I like to say sometimes with teens or even kids in Iwana, you know, when you were born, I was, came to the hospital and saw you when you're just a, just a little baby. But being, having done this for so long as I have and been able to, to watch uh, young people uh, put their faith in Jesus, make a decision for Christ, whether it's vacation Bible school or, or an Awana or Sunday school class or some other setting. Have them come up and tell me, maybe some even going through the water of baptism. Um, it is encouraging, so encouraging, to be able to look around the room and, and see faces of those that are uh, demonstrating that that was real, that that took root, that they are did not just believe about Jesus, but believe in him, and it's changed who they are, and they're impacting the next generation themselves. And that brings tremendous joy to my heart, but it also been around long enough to know that not every one of those that made a decision that came and told me after vacation Bible school that they just got saved or that even walked down into that tank of water to be baptized, that not every one of them continued down that path. And as a pastor, quite honestly, nothing breaks my heart more uh, than recognizing that there's some that Jesus has become someone they're a fan of, someone that they're familiar with, but not someone they base their life around. And I don't know, maybe, maybe that's you in some sense today. If so, I'd encourage you to really look at that. Really look at that. I hope that you, your faith in Jesus is certain. You don't have any question about that. But could it be that you've let it become too familiar? That you've let it become in your life a superficial sidelight instead of the central part of who, who you are. Jesus is looking for fully committed followers, not just fans. The last thing that I want to share is something that I kind of pondered, maybe making the whole sermon about this, but um, I look at the way Jesus responded to those that knew him so well from his growing up years, those that knew him so well because they were from a supernatural world, the demons that recognized his identity right out. And the adoring crowds, you know, that saw this amazing thing. Jesus looked in, in every direction and saw all these different things and he wasn't, he wasn't affected by it like we so often are. Here, here's the way I word it. Jesus did not live for the approval that most people crave. Uh, he wasn't motivated by the acceptance of his hometown friends. 
Uh, he did not want the demons revealing his identity. He did not even listen to the amazed crowd. You know, at the end, they, they want him to stay and to do more incredible things. He said, no, sorry, I'm moving on. There's other places that need to hear this, hear this message too. He didn't crave the approval that people so often do crave. He instead maintained a focus on God's mission, communicating the gospel, loving people in need, seeking the approval of one, his heavenly Father alone. And I, I find that so challenging, so helpful. Uh, it is quite tempting to be motivated by the wrong things. We want people to like us. We want to sit at the cool kids' table. We want to fit in. We want to be validated by those in our circle. Jesus operated with a different mindset. He really did. He wanted to share God's truth. He aimed to practically love those in need. But there was only one thing that motivated him. And that was pleasing his heavenly Father. And you might think about this. Um, an impactful life is one that walks in the shadow of Jesus. Uh, an impactful life might best be characterized uh, following his example as shaped by God's word, uh, seeking to show love, driven by a desire to please God alone. Got a historical example I read this past week. Um, on April 16th, 1521, just over 500 years ago, Martin Luther stood trial the Diet of Worms. Uh, it was a, a trial being held by the Catholic Church. Uh, Martin Luther had begun the, what's become known as the Protestant Reformation when he protested with the sell, to the selling of indulgences to buy your salvation uh, through the Catholic Church. Uh, funding and capital improvement projects, basically. He protested to all that um, and began to write, began to teach. And his teaching was anchored in the Bible that salvation is by grace alone uh, and faith alone in Jesus alone. And the author that I was reading uh, this in, he described what happened at that Diet of Worms, that trial that uh, Luther stood at in 1521. He wrote this, after displaying Luther's books, the examiner asked a simple question. Do you defend them all, or do you care to reject a part? And Luther's response was curious, especially in light of his bold writings. Perhaps he was intimidated by the collection of the most powerful men ever assembled in that area. This is what Luther said, to say too little or too much would be dangerous. He replied in a barely audible voice, I beg you some time, to think it over. The author wrote, he seemed to be teetering between the fear of man and the fear of the Lord, which is kind of understandable. These guys held his fate in their hands. But something happened by six o'clock the next evening. Luther demonstrated the boldness that was characteristic of his writing. Such boldness was not self-confidence because he was a man who walked humbly before God, but it was confidence in God's word. In his remarks, he defended his writings and told the men who had the power to kill him, I must walk in the fear of the Lord. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything. For to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. God help me, here I stand, I cannot do otherwise. You know, Martin Luther changed the world 500 years ago because he wasn't swayed by the opinion that others held of him. He was focused on God's word and pleasing his heavenly Father alone. And there's a lot in that that is left from the model by his Savior and your Savior. Jesus maintained a focus on God's mission. A focus on God's mission. Communicating the gospel, loving people in need, seeking the approval of His Heavenly Father of, alone. And I just want to say, you know, in the inner workings of our heart, so many factors can be at play. And I don't know what, what might be at play in your, your soul this morning. But I think you probably do. And I would encourage you to consider What's at play in your heart this morning? 
Do you know about Jesus? Or, or do you really know Him as your personal Savior? Have you chosen to believe in Him and trust, depend on Him alone for a relationship with God? Uh, have you allowed yourself to become a little too casual, a little too superficial in your relationship with Jesus Christ? Is following Jesus an extra? Or is it what your life is all about? Is it possible that in the inner workings of your heart, you've let yourself, you've recognized this morning that you started to just become a fan not a fully committed follower of the Savior. Maybe, maybe this last part rings true. Uh, do you live for the approval of others? Is that what motivates you the most? Or is your drive deeper? Do you have a passion to please your Heavenly Father uh, and accomplish the mission He has for your life? Two shocking Sabbaths reveal Jesus' mission and his motives. But his example ought to prod us to consider our own. What do I live for? Am I, am I truly, truly a follower of Jesus Christ? And if so, do I live for the approval, for the, the smile, the pleasure of my Heavenly Father? Or am I settling? Settling for something less. I'm going to sing a song in just a minute, but let's pray together. I want to pray for us this morning. Father God, I thank you so much for your word and for the example of Jesus. He came here to rescue people like me and each one of us. I'm so thankful, Lord, that he did that, that he was willing to enter this human race so that he could go through all that needed to be gone through and accomplish everything he needed to accomplish, showing his perfect life, showing his deity through uh, his life, through his miracles, even through the testimony of the demonic forces that hated him. Um, so thankful that Jesus is who he is and that he came to do what he did. And I pray for every person this morning here. Uh, you know, if there's just one person here who does not know that they've settled the beginning of that relationship with you, that they've placed their faith in Jesus themselves, that they need to do that. And I would pray they would do that today. But all of us ought to look at this. All of us need to consider. Um, is it real for me and is it as important to me as it ought to be? Or am I a fan instead of a follower? Am I driven by what people think? Or I'm, I'm motivated by more than anything else. Does this bring glory to my Heavenly Father? Does this please Him with the way that I live? Father, you know all of us. You know the ways that we need to be affected by your word. And today as your word intersects with our life, my prayer is that we'll identify. We'll identify that area that we recognize needs to change. And we'll ask for grace. We'll seek your help to not just identify it, but do something about it. Give us grace to know what to do and then grace to make those changes. In Jesus' name I pray. Mm -hmm.